Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Grand Rounds. I'm Dr. Jonas Arno, for those of you who don't know me and those of you who do know me. So I wanna welcome you. And I also would like to introduce Dr. Jenny Wynn, who is one of our Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellows, who we are so happy to have at UCLA. Uh, Dr. Um, Wynn is currently our Inpatient Chief Fellow at UCLA. She completed her undergraduate work at Stanford and then came over to us to the David Geffen School of Medicine for medical school. And then she went to one of our favorite partner uh, institutions, University of Washington for her residency and uh, completed DBT training there and was certified there in DBT. Uh, during her residency, she also served as resident fellow member with the APA Assembly and was uh, selected as an APA child fellow. Dr. Wynn's clinical interests include, include acute psychiatric care settings, uh, including inpatient hospitalization and emergency psychiatry, which is such an important area. And she's focused on suicide prevention and mood disorders. Her research and scholarly interests include suicide prevention, which you will see why as she presents her work this morning, and also addressing disparities in mental health care, especially for Asian Americans. And a particularly important issue for her in addition is ensuring that evidence-based care gets translated into the clinical settings where we take care of youths and families every day. Her recent scholarly work includes a quality improvement project that reduced the disproportionate use of restraints and seclusions among BIPOC patients in a psychiatric ICU, an educational module on cultural models of suicide risk factors, and assisting with our very own PCORI funded Youth Partners in Care for Suicide Prevention Study, also known as Safe Steps. Jenny, I will hand the... Uh, uh, slides over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Osarno, for the kind introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here today and for the opportunity to talk to you all about an area that I'm passionate about, which is suicide prevention. I hope this will be the beginning of our many conversations to come and uh, about suicide prevention practices and as best as we are doing now, how can we do better? As I was putting this talk together and in reflecting on my training thus far, a few questions came to my mind that I will also pose to you, to all of you. How many of you recall being taught how to formally do a suicide risk assessment? What about safety planning, including what questions do you ask and how do you engage with the patient and their family? Aside from, aside from what otherwise do, such as here's the plan, let's fill it out. How much more training do we actually get? Even though suicide prevention is a big part of psychiatry, we're not formally taught it, and it's something we rarely learn how to do on the job. Uh, while I have no financial disclosures, I am part of the PCORI study, as Dr. Sarno mentioned, and this is related to my talk today as our research utilizes the safety acute intervention. Uh, um, Throughout this talk, please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A and we'll work to address it at the end of the talk. Here are the learning objectives for my talk. By the end of this talk, you'll be able to define at least two risk and protective factors for youth suicide, name at least two types of evidence-based intervention for youth suicide, and describe the components for the safety acute model. First, let's review some of the data related to suicide among youth in the United States. Before we dive into the data, let's see where you think suicide ranks in terms of death by age group. Uh, in the next few uh, minutes, give a ranking from one to 10 and give a one if you think suicide is the leading cause of death for these age groups. The age groups are 10 to 14 years old, 15 to 24 years old, and 25 to 34 years old. All right, let's see how we did. In 2020, suicide ranked as the second or third leading cause of death among these three age groups for adolescents. 
A few years before in 2017, suicide was the second leading cause of death across all age groups, across all age groups. And um, the difference that we're seeing now is that uh, homicide is the second leading cause of death for the ages 15 to 24. At first glance, this can appear that suicide has improved. However, I wanna clarify that that's that is not the case at all. What's actually happening is that homicide worsen. Suicide, uh, as seen in this bar graph, suicide kills more than more youth than other major medical illnesses in the age range of 15 to 25. And here, in looking across the changes over time, Deaths by suicide have increased by 29% between 2012 and 2020 for adolescents between 15 and 19 years old. The bottom line here is that suicide rates are increasing over the years and the crisis is still ongoing for our youth. While the suicide data is alarming, it is important to note that many more youths have, su have serious suicidal ideation leading to attempts which brings them to the emergency department or ED. The number of deaths we previously reviewed is just scratching the surface of this. About 17% of adolescents endorse serious SI and about 100 to 200 suicide attempts occur for, um, happen with each death. I wanna clarify here that this shows the severity of this crisis. This does not mean that out of 100 to 200 suicide attempts, one youth dies. No, what this means is that there are one to 200 youth who, are tr who tried to kill themselves, though did not die for various reasons. About seven to eight percent of adolescents attempt suicide each year. And as you may know, the strongest predictor of a completed suicide in the future is a prior suicide attempt. Over the last several years, we've been plagued by the COVID pandemic. And during this time, our adolescent, for our adolescent girls, there, were a, there was a 51% increase in presentation to the ED for suicidality. And for our adolescent boys, this was a much lower rate at 4%, but there was still an increase. This is how we see this situation manifest, as we know that girls are more likely to report these thoughts and behaviors However, it is the boys who are more likely to die by suicide. Suicide, as you may know, results from a tragic storm of different interacting factors in the youth and their environment. Here are some of the modifiable risk factors that you may have seen before. For our youth, uh, we can see acute distress, traumatic stress, impulsivity. In the environment, we, we can see access to dangerous or lethal means for self-harm. Here are some of the non-modifiable risk factors, such as being part of a vulnerable population or having a family history of suicide. We also need to take into account protective factors such as hope and reason for living, caregiver, protective monitoring and supervision, and restricted access to lethal means as we assess for risk. And here, I want to clarify that when I say caregiver, I'm referring to a parent, an aunt, an uncle, anyone who's involved in the youth's care. Up until now, we have reviewed the chronic risk factors for suicide. Now let's take a look at the acute risk factors or warning signs of imminent risk that's happening right now with the youth. Some of these to keep in mind are when the youth is talking or posting on social media that, they, that he or she wants to die or indications that they would be better off dead. Any sense you're getting that the youth is experiencing unbearable pain and is feeling trapped? And any evidence that the youth is making a plan for suicide? Additional warning signs would include the youth putting their affairs into order, such as giving away possessions that they, that they really love, 
Um, and then one that really catches my eye every time is when the youth suddenly becomes cheerful after a period of depression. These are all the signs that should put us on high alert that this youth is at high risk. Now I want to briefly discuss the role of method and impulsivity. Youth often are not fully informed, nor are they, do they fully understand the lethality of certain suicide attempts. Youth can sometimes be ambivalent about wanting to die and may not actually fully understand the implications of their action. Therefore, death by suicide can sometimes occur by accident. I, to highlight this, I'd like to share two examples with you all. In the first example, we have a youth who reported that they made a lethal suicide attempt with full intent to die and was actually very surprised they are still alive. When asked about their attempt, this youth reported that they took one pill of extra strength adult Tylenol and believed that they would die. In this example, this youth did not understand dosage and what would happen after taking this one extra strength Tylenol, instead believing that this medication, because it's for adults and is stronger in strength, that they would die. A second example is that we have a youth who took an entire bottle of Tylenol over the course of 24 hours. And when asked if this was a suicide attempt, the youth clearly stated that it was not. When asked what was going on, the youth reported that they were reading the label on the Tylenol bottle and saw that this medication can help with pain. And so the youth continued to take as many pills as possible to help ease the emotional pain they were feeling. And so this youth ended up going to the ED and required medical care. From these examples, it goes to show that because of a youth's ambivalence and lack of understanding for safety, it is absolutely important for caregivers to provide lethal means restriction and protective monitoring, especially during times of high stress and elevated risk. Among our, those who have died by suicide, many have had contacts with a healthcare provider and communicated a psychological problem prior to their death. This has occurred in both the primary care and the mental health care setting. Within a one year of suicide, 75% had contact with their PCP and 33% had contact with their mental health care provider. Within one month of suicide, 45% had contact with their PCP and 20% with their mental health care provider. These visits are key opportunities for us to intervene. Even though follow-up care to an ED visit is important, this is often very difficult in practice for many of our patients. This could be due to stigma, or other barriers such as a lack of transportation or scheduling difficulties. Therefore, continued contact, support, and monitoring are absolutely critical until the patient is connected to their next point of care. That was some pretty heavy data that we just reviewed. And so now I'd like to shift focus and discuss some evidence-based intervention for youth suicide in the emergency care setting. So why focus on the emergency care setting? The ED or emergency department is an important site for suicide prevention as identified by the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. Many youths who are at risk for self-harm and suicide often do not receive outpatient care. And when these youth present to the ED for suicidality, they are already at an even higher risk than before. Therefore, the ED is a window of opportunity to deliver an effective intervention and link youth to outpatient mental health treatment. In a recent meta-analysis by Dubnik and her colleagues in 2020, 
looked at suicide prevention interventions in the acute care setting. Their analyses showed that brief interventions in the ED were associated with reduced subsequent suicide attempts and increased linkage to follow-up care. All the studies in this meta-analysis included some combination of these components, but not necessarily all of them, which includes brief contact interventions, such as a phone call, care coordination, such as scheduling outpatient follow-up, or collaborating with the patient's family to reduce barriers to attending follow-up care, safety planning interventions, uh, and other brief therapies, such as functional analysis, MI or motivational interviewing and problem solving focused therapy. All right, for the remainder of this talk, I will be focusing specifically on one intervention, safety acute or safety A, which was actually one of the interventions included in the meta analysis I just reviewed. Um, so with Safety A, I first learned about this intervention during my first year of fellowship didactic when Dr. Lucas Zello taught my class about self-harm and safety planning early in our fellowship. A few quick things, a few things quickly stood out to me during this talk and about this intervention. First, Dr. Zello's lecture was the first time that I was formally taught how to do a safety plan with a suicidal patient and to do it in a structured and systematic way. This intervention drew upon strengths and other positive areas from the youth and their environment, which can sometimes be hard to do during an evaluation as we're trying to manage the high-risk situation in front of us. Also, this intervention brought the youth and family together and empowered them to stay safe outside of the hospital setting. Since learning about this intervention and receiving training, I've incorporated this model into my own safety evaluation and management. And so I'm very excited to talk to you about the different parts of it today. All right, to start, here's a brief background on safety A. This intervention was developed by Dr. Jonas Sarno here at UCLA. It was previously known as the Family Intervention for Suicide Prevention, or FIS, in the literature in its previous incarnation. This uh, intervention was based on an earlier specialized ED intervention originally developed by Dr. Rothman Boris and colleagues in 1996 at UCLA. And recently, in December of 2020, uh, Safety A was added to the National Registry of Evidence-Based Practices for Suicide Prevention by SAMHSA. So what exactly is Safety A? Um, it is a brief single encounter intervention that is delivered in the ED for youth with suicidal ideation or suicide attempts focused on safety and stabilization. It is both a screening, a suicide screening tool and a suicide risk management tool. Safety A in practice is quite flexible and can be adjusted to the youth and caregivers needs as well as our uh, clinical practice um, and can be delivered within 20 to 90 minutes as time allows for it. Here's an example of how Safety A can fit into the ED workflow. Generally, when a youth comes into the ED for a suicidality, they initially receive medical clearance, and then we on the psychiatry team get a page for psychiatric evaluation. Safety A can be delivered with the psychiatric evaluation and can do two things. One, it can facilitate a safe discharge if the youth is uh, deemed appropriate, or two, it can provide valuable information that the youth may need a higher level of care. Stay tuned for more on that. Safety A takes a therapeutic approach to risk assessment by eliciting for protective processes in both the youth and their environment. It also elicits important information regarding the ability of the youth and family to support safety outside of the hospital setting. This intervention has its roots in CBT, DBT, as well as family and community-based interventions. 
Some of the therapeutic components include improving linkage to care, increasing safety, protective processes, and hope, and improving the youth's emotion regulation and distress tolerance to the unbearable pain they're suffering from. The goal of Safety A is to decrease the short-term risk of SI and SA by providing a crisis intervention for the youth in the ED, enhancing the youth safety and improving the linkage to follow-up care. So what's the evidence behind this? In 2011, Dr. Sarno and colleagues conducted a two-site randomized control trial where youth were randomized to receiving treatment as usual in the ED, uh, or safety A. The results showed that 90% of patients who received safety A had linkage to care after their ED visit versus 76% for those who received treatment as usual. Overall, this indicated that safety A is effective in improving linkage care where youth were more likely to attend outpatient treatment receive psychotherapy and have more psychotherapy visits, as well as receiving combined psychotherapy and medication management. Uh, more recent quasi-experimental uh, studies and open trials have found that safety A was associated with early reduction in suicide, suicidal ideation and intent, improve self-efficacy to stay safe among youth, and improve confidence in the ability to keep youth safe amongst caregivers. So now that we know that safety A works, let's dive into it a bit more and um, the contents of safety A using the ABCD approach, uh, which stands for assess, build hope, connect, and develop plans. The first component is assess, which involves asking about suicide and doing a suicide risk evaluation. This is what we usually already do in the ED as part of our psychiatric evaluation for any youth presenting with suicidality. When asking about suicide, as you may know, there is no evidence that asking about suicide actually increases the risk of suicide. Youth and caregivers tend to have a favorable view of screening as they view this as a sign that you're interested and you care about their kid. Common recommended screening tools that you can also use for this portion includes the ASK questionnaire or the CSSRS. And in this portion, we are specifically assessing for the three S's, suicidal ideation or urges, self-harm, which includes both suicidal and non-suicidal self-harm as this can progress to a suicide attempt, and suicide attempts, all of the factors that increase death by suicide. The next component is build hope. And you do this by building rapport and a relationship with the youth through listening and showing that you care in, in this brief encounter with them in the ED. You also draw out the strengths and reason for living from the youth, which helps them to recognize their own resiliency as well as that of their family. And lastly, and most importantly, you want to change the rhythm of the session. And what I mean by this is you want to shift from a focus on problem behaviors and why they're coming in, which the youth likely already feels that they're in trouble for, to thoughts and behaviors that are incompatible with suicide, such as their own self-worth, hope and reasons for living. One important thing to note about this step is that if the youth is not able to identify any strengths in themselves or their environment, this can be an indicator for us that they may need a higher level of care and gives us a window into their state of mind. This component is actually one of my favorite parts about safety A and I actually um, Start, all, start out all my safety evaluations now with it by asking for strengths and as a way to build rapport and get to know the youth. Some of the youth I've worked with have really appreciated this because it, it gives them the sense that I'm not there just to talk about problems. I actually want to get to know who they are. 
And uh, for many of them, this has helped ease them into opening up about more heavy topics as our evaluation progresses. The next step is connecting, and which focuses on working with the caregiver to identify strengths in the family and the environment to build protective social connections for our youth. We also want to focus on strengthening existing connections between youth and protective adults. And as a way to kind of bring the family together and rally around this youth during this time. The last component is to develop a plan to keep the youth safe. And we do this by restricting access to lethal means. I know you've heard me say this so many times throughout this presentation already because it's absolutely one of the most important interventions we can do for suicide prevention. And the other part is to develop a safety plan for coping in the future should similar situations arise. The steps to this part involves identifying warning signs that signal an increase in emotion dysregulation and any distressing situations that will increase suicide risk. We also want to focus on developing a safety plan that includes having actions, thoughts, and people that the youth can turn to for help to stay safe. And we also want to work on helping the youth consider how their safety plan can be used both inside and outside of the hospital when they leave. So how do we go about helping youth to identify warning signs? A really helpful tool that can be used is called an emotion thermometer or a subject units of distress scales in the adult world to assess the youth's thoughts, behaviors, and emotions when they're feeling suicidal. This can also pr help provide a language that the youth can use to communicate their level of distress and risk to their caregiver. The youth will also learn how to, how and when to use their safety plan based on the information from their emotion thermometer. Here's an example of the, our emotion thermometer. Generally, when I do this activity with the youth, I begin here at zero, which is their calm and comfortable state. And then I will shift to 10, which is their most stress or suicidal, uh, or when they have suicidal or self-harming urges. I also identify a neutral at five, and most importantly, identify the progression from feeling neutral to a more dangerous feeling. As you go through this activity, attend to the situations, the thoughts, the behaviors, the feelings, and the body sensation that appear to be key triggers for these youth. These prompting events and warning signs will signal to our team that, that they need to use their safety plan to cope. Um, some key takeaways about emotions and the emotions thermometer. Emotions can be intense, painful, and unbearable for our kids. And the emotion thermometer is a tool to assist youth in understanding and regulating their emotions. And most importantly, this tool can help to escalate their emotional reaction and shift focus to coping to downregulate these emotions for them instead of remaining focused on the stress and problem situation that prompted these suicidal impulses to begin with. And another important thing that I wanna note with this step is that if the youth is unable to identify the various levels of distress or emotions they're experiencing as they're when they're suicidal, this provides us with important information on their level of insight with regards to their behavior and their level of risk, which can be an indicator that a higher level of care may be needed. With all of the information you have gathered thus far, we want to work with the youth to put a safety plan together that they can take home with them. This plan will include what the youth can do or think to stay safe, who the youth can talk to to stay safe, and how the youth can modify their environment to stay safe. This is an example of what our safety plan looks like, and you might have seen other versions of this 
in practice. It is also very important during this process to include the caregiver who will be involved with protective supervision, promoting skills usage as part of the coping strategies, and lethal means restriction. So that was an overview, a very brief overview of Safety A. It was not meant to be a full training. If you're interested in more information or training in Safety A, please refer to my resource section at the end of this slide, this slide deck. Now that we've gone over the basics of Safety A, let's take a minute and reflect on these steps that I shared with you. What is one element of this intervention that you are already doing? What is something new that you learned about today that you'd like to try? Please take a minute or so to jot down your answers. All right. Um, in this last part of our time together, I'd like to share with you how Safety A has been implemented in the clinical setting. In 2016, Petrison and colleagues adapted Safety A to their pediatric psychiatry ED and CL service at Children's Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. In this series of studies, they specifically looked at the impact of the various elements of Safety A towards disposition, as well as provider or clinician satisfaction and feasibility when using this intervention. As, um, as part of their implementation, their ED staff and providers were, um, who are directly involved with the patient's care were trained by Dr. Sarno in Safety A. And the components that they specifically adapted include using an emotion thermometer, uh, safety planning, uh, with coping skills linked to the emotion thermometer, as well as commitment to uh, safety and follow-up plan, as well, uh, and importantly, psychoeducation to the caregiver on limiting access to lethal means, symptoms and behaviors of suicidality, and the importance of follow-up care. The, um, <clears throat> the outcomes of their studies showed that patients who completed Safety A were more likely to be recommended to lower levels of care, and Safety A showed positive outcomes as an acceptable and feasible intervention in the pediatric ED and CL program. So this was at Dallas, Texas, but what are we doing at UCLA? As Dr. Sarno, the developer of, UC of uh, Safety A is here at UCLA, the goal was to apply her work to streamline and enhance our current practices in the ED for suicide prevention care. This was done through a collaboration with Dr. Lucas Solo, who is uh, the training director of the ASAP Center, as well as a member of Dr. Sarno's team. Dr. Jenna Chung, who is the director of our Child Emergency Consult Service, and myself. And um, collaboratively, we reviewed the current practices on the PEDS ED Consult Service and noticed that many elements of Safety A were actually already being implemented. Uh, we also worked to incorporate the following components of Safety A into the current ED workflow which included elements of the emotions thermometer to identify levels of distress that are especially associated with suicide risk and communicating this to the caregiver, having a structured time with the patient and caregiver to safety plan in a more united way, and getting commitment from the patient and families to use their safety plan and follow up with outpatient care. The work is already starting. In conclusion, some of the safety A techniques that I've talked about during my uh, time with you today are already being applied to our psychiatric evaluations in the ED. 
However, we all have our own way of doing safety planning, which can fall short of the full evidence-based approach. The goal here is to supplement what you are already doing as clinicians and increase the level of comfort and confidence in working with suicidal youth. By simply adding a few more elements, we can start moving towards the highest standard of care for a population that needs it the most. Um, here are some resources. Um, as I mentioned, if you're interested in more information or training on Safety A, please visit our ASAP website. And here are also links to both our emotions thermometer and safety planning for your use. And um, lastly, I'd like to take the time to uh, thank Dr. Sarno for being my discussant today and for your mentorship in this important area of work. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Lucas Zillow for training me in Safety A and consulting for this talk. And lastly, I would like to thank my husband, Lon, for the presentation design and for his ongoing and unrelenting support as I continue to pursue this line of work. Thank you for spending uh, your morning with me. And now I'd like to pass it back to Dr. Sarno to highlight some key points about suicide prevention and ED care, and then address your questions. Hi, thank you so much, Jenny. There's nothing that gives me more pleasure than hearing someone as bright and thoughtful and clinically uh, brilliant as yourself, really taking something that I've worked so hard on and taking it to the next step and, and making it really useful, which is our goal, right? We take care of kids and we really want them to not die and to thrive. So that, that's where my heart is and clearly your heart is there too. So um, thank you. Uh, if you give me the slides, I'll just make a couple of points and then turn things over to the group because I wanna uh, allow us to have lots of questions and discussion. And I'm not good with slides. So I asked uh, Ernie to help me. Um, so let me just say while he's pulling the slides up that, um, I started out on the inpatient service at UCLA. Most of you don't know that, that about me. I'm, a lot of you may not know me at all because I've been fairly ill for the past few years. So um, I've been around a little bit less than usual or a lot less than usual. Um, and uh, so I work in the UCLA YSAM program. Um, after 10 years on inpatient, this is my first job. So everything I know, I really learned here from the kids and my wonderful colleagues here. Um, and in our program, we have doctors Mesa, uh, Jocelyn Mesa, who is um, uh, fantastic, uh, fairly newcomer to UCLA, and Dr. Zulo, who uh, Jenny's already mentioned. And then there's Jenny and Dr. Lee, who've been uh, expanding this into emergency psychiatry here on a clinical uh, side, as well as in our PCORI study, which uh, I wasn't going to talk too much about. But most of you probably know that we have a very large multi-site PCORI trial uh, going on at UCLA, Brown, Duke, all of you medical center, and um, I'm leaving out Utah, Utah, my colleagues at Utah. Um, so, so we have a big program, well, a, a small clinical program at YSAM, but we have a lot of people who have participated from around the country. Many of you may know Jenny Hughes, who was here uh, several years ago and has now gone to Nationwide. She continues to do trainings for us, Silvana Vargas, David Goldston at Duke, and allow is now taking this work into the school system. So this has really been moving on. And if you'll go to the next slide, I wanted to make some comments on really how important this Grand Rounds is at this point in time. We just had about a week ago, a new CDC report on 2021 data, which really underscore the urgent need to address mental health in our kids. These are data from the US high school student surveys that really show that as COVID-19 pandemic has gone on, we are seeing more and more effects of it. Nearly three in five of our teenage girls are reporting persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. That's almost 60%. 
and, and a nearly 60% increase in the highest level reported over the past decade. Nearly one in three seriously considered attempting suicide. That rate used to be about 20%, 15 to 20%. And in about one in five experienced sexual violence. So I, I wanted to report that because suicidality doesn't increase in a vacuum and uh, the association with trauma is really, really strong and important. Next slide. Uh, so I wanted to, consistent with Jenny's points this morning, uh, really emphasize the importance of emergency psychiatry. We are working with the cancer of psychiatry, basically, when we're working uh, with suicide. Um, children do die, although it is rare, but it is, is, is too common. It's, as Jenny pointed out, it's the second leading cause of death in our kids. And the emergency care system has really become a safety net for treating pediatric mental health issues. Between 2007 and 15, ED visits for suicide attempts and ideation doubled among our kids. And in 2020, we really see the impact of the pandemic where we're seeing a big increase in the proportion of ED mental health visits, up 31% in kids ages 12 to 17 and 24% in kids five to 11. And if you go to the next slide, you can see what we've been trying to do about it. Um, as I said, I started working in an in inpatient unit. And as you know, uh, there you feel a lot of times like you're at the bottom of a cliff grabbing a kid after they've jumped off and we wanna keep them from jumping again. We wanna get them earlier and uh, prevent uh, really um, serious consequences of stress basically and mental illness. And we've, uh, through our center, the UCLA ASAP Center, we've done trainings all over the country. Every star here represents a state where we've been doing work and we've exported multiple interventions so I'll just to name them briefly so you know, we have the safety acute intervention, which I renamed, it was originally called the family intervention for suicide prevention, but I really, I renamed it because I wanted people to understand that the real goal here was safety and, and really stabilizing kids who are unsafe. So that's our emergency intervention. We've been doing it in e EDs where we started out doing the original work. It's been exported to primary care, to general mental health, to schools, to juvenile justice, to emergency pet teams, uh, all over the country we've been doing this. Uh, the Dallas Project was only one of all of these stars. Um, in the initial work, we found that we could get kids to care, which is really critical, right? Because if you can't get them to care, you can't get them to effective care. But what we found was getting to care actually didn't matter in terms of clinical outcomes. It was only, um, only when we learn later, when we developed evidence-informed approaches to suicide-specific care, where we saw real clinical benefits. So we developed what we called the, the safety intervention. Now I'm calling it Safety C for comprehensive, which is a brief 12-session DBT-informed treatment that really emphasizes the kid and the family. And for some kids, you may be able to do that for 12 weeks and then maybe shift them into a DBT group if they're still having problems with self-harm, and that may be enough, based on our data, I think, to uh, lead to improved outcomes. We also um, are a center for DBT. As you know, we were, as you, I think you know, we were uh, one of the big sites for the uh, adolescent DBT trial. We're still publishing on that. We have a DBT program and an advisory board made up of Alec Miller, who developed the with um, Jill Rathis and Marsha Linehan, the adolescent adaptation. Um, so Alec Miller is on our advisory board, Linda DeMap, who's done enormously brilliant work trying to bring uh, evidence-based DBT-informed approaches into usual care um, in big health systems through a variety of digital and other kinds of approaches. And Lars Malam, who did the, who led the Norwegian DBT trial, which occurred a little bit before ours. Um, and let's see, we've also developed uh, the lock and protect intervention, which is a really interesting one that you may be interested in. It's being tested in a few trials, one at Columbia right now. Uh, it's a decision aid for parents to help with lethal means counseling. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it, 
it, it got rave reviews at Columbia. I think almost everybody recommended that it be used in the ED there. And stay tuned, we've implemented a um, step care for suicide prevention intervention where we match the intensity of the interventions that uh, the kid and family get to the level of risk. And that's our um, step to care health study that's being conducted in Kaiser Permanente Northwest and the results will be out really, really soon. Uh, so I think that's a, that the main interventions, as you can see, there's a lot of interest. Uh, they're being, we've got a big trial that just starting in New York and I think seven hospitals serving mostly a black population um, of kids and uh, being led by Michael Lindsay and Cheryl King. Uh, that's going on. So uh, let us take some questions. What have we got? A question from Michael Strober. Thank you, Dr. Strober. Given your background in this area, I know this will be an excellent presentation. My question, as this is an urgently needed short-term intervention, how does it consider the well-known range wide of developmental, clinical, familial, and psychiatric factors to which suicidal behavior and risk of future attempts is associated? Does the model include planning to address these complexities following the acute management phase of the intervention, given the risk of subsequent attempts? That is a great question. I'm going to let Jenny take it first, and I'll add if I have anything more to say. Thank you, Dr. Snyder, and thank you, Dr. Strober, for, um, for this really interesting question. And so, um, as, as I mentioned during the presentation, a lot of the background going into developing safety A is really informed by developmental theories as well as different therapeutic techniques. And as you mentioned, there's a wide variety of factors that, that come in that needs to be addressed as part of this, the care for these youth. And absolutely, the first part is acute stabilization, which is what we do in this single encounter um, intervention with safety acute. Um, as Dr. Asarno alluded to, there's more components to safety outside of safety acute. We have uh, after safety A, there's safety B or safety brief that continues to um, look more into some of these factors. And then thirdly, there's safety C or safety comprehensive, which is more skills training from a DBT approach to address some of these other factors as well. Um, Dr. Sarno, what, uh, anything else you'd like to kind of uh, add more to that? Um, well, Mike, are, are you satisfied? <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I think that it's important to remember that safety acute as developed in the emergency department included a follow-up component to help them get linked to care. So people were called afterwards and a motivational enhancement approach was used to help them get to the best possible care for them. Unfortunately, in you know two, early 2000s when this was done, uh, what was out there tended, I mean, we didn't know that much about, to be honest, in that time about how to best treat this problem. So what was out there didn't seem to make a big difference. We're hoping that that makes a difference now and that it truly does address those issues. Mike had another question here, which I will take because I think it's really important in addition. In some cases, the suicide attempt is linked to chronic high intensity family conflict or critical attitudes towards the child such as rejection of the child's sexual identity. How does the model consider this? On this point, on the inpatient service, we see families who insist on a very rapid discharge after the child's life-threatening attempt. And I, I'd like to make two points in response to that. One is that um, what's different about safety acute than the uh, Stanley and Brown approach to safety plan is it really is a bottom up approach which starts with what we know about kids and that's that their brains are still developing and they need other adults in their environment to help care for them and keep them safe. And so we really do emphasize that. And when things are so tense in the family environment that the family, that the best thing the family can do is to help the kid get to grandma or Aunt Sally or their therapist when the kid's in trouble. We help them to do that with safety acute. 
Um, and with the very rapid discharge from inpatient, which you mentioned, which is sure different than when I was there where we had the kids for about three months, um, the outpatient care is terribly, terribly important. And that's where we've been focusing uh, more recently is the link to the uh, outpatient care. I guess that's not completely true because the PCORI will include 1500 kids from emergency rooms. So, <laughs> but we're, we're focusing on both. Uh, let's see, what other questions do we have? James McCracken, Dr. McCracken, thank you. Uh, can safety A be administered by non-mental health personnel? Jenny, what do you think? I think uh, with all the trainings I've done so far, we've, we've trained um, anywhere from psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers. I think it can be something with, a, with adequate training that can be administered by non-mental health personnel in the sense that it can be adapted to multiple settings, not just the ED, not just inpatient, but also other uh, care settings or possibly um, school as well. Yes. So as I said, we are implementing it in schools uh, with people that don't have extensive clinical training. They're often uh, school-based counselors, uh, as well as uh, with some of the um, emergency paraprofessional personnel that go out. So we'll know. I, but my, my, my answer to that is yes, with appropriate support when they need it, uh, I think. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Don't see any other questions. We have six minutes. Does anyone want to ask another question? Oh, here we go. Dr. McCracken, what's the longest follow up information available from samples after safety acute? That is a great question. Um, the trials that have been done up to now have really been fairly short-term follow-ups. We had kids up to a year in the initial trial, which involved Harbor and uh, the UCLA EDs. In our PCORI trial, we will have a year. We should probably request a second year. Um, I haven't emphasized the long-term follow-up because what happens afterwards is so important. And I think it has to be linked to that in the trial. So that's why in our PCORI trial, we're looking at therapeutic follow-up. And I should say that in the uh, Kaiser Permanente Northwest Portland trial, everybody got safety A within the intervention and then they went into the state stepped care intervention based on the safety A and additional evaluation that was done. And in that trial, we have a year follow-up. So that's what we've got, I think. Jenny, do you have anything to add to that about the importance of what happens after safety acute? And what kind of follow-up we need to have for these children. And as I was looking through the literature on um, safety A and prior, prior studies, it's, safety A, as I mentioned, is really great for linking to care, but the next step, as you alluded to, Dr. Sarno, is getting the appropriate care for ongoing suicide prevention, such as DBT, which is one of our most evidence-informed uh, approaches for safety. And so I think um, even after doing all of this, these are, this is the first step in the process where we're getting, uh, we're delivering an intervention, kind of modeling what an intervention may look like to these youth and what mental health care can look like for them in the ED and then getting them into the next step in the outpatient care, which is where I think generally most of mental health care exists and takes place is in the outpatient setting. That's why having all of this, um, follow-up care and focusing on that is the, the most important thing that we can do. And I think it's important to remember that a lot of these children will have chronic risk mm -hmm. in the sense that an acute risk model and addressing the acute risk is, is going to be important. And we know from our data that if the kids responded early on to um, an acute intervention, they were more likely to do better 
after a three to 12 month period. So I think that it's important what we do at the acute level, but to be aware that if something horrible happens to someone, they may become suicidal again. So we need long-term monitoring strategies, hopefully through integrated behavioral health care with primary care, because most people have primary care. And even with our DBT kids who we carried for six months of intensive treatment, very intensive treatment, they need, uh, they need something after that. We learned that in the DBT trial. So we're at 9.58. So I think it might be time to uh, say thank you to everybody. Uh, Jenny, you wanna say anything at the end of this lovely grand round? Since so thank, you. thank you, Dr. Sino. And thank you everyone for uh, your interest in this talk. Um, some ne next steps that I'm considering is thinking about cultural adaptation, which uh, many of which we're going to do. Uh, we have a lot of youth and minority populations within the Pocori study, as well as thinking about how um, the adaptation for me is especially important because that's how we're going to be able to disseminate an evidence-based treatment that's developed in an academic center into the communities that need it most. And so that's some of the considerations for me moving forward in addition to the study that we're working on. Um, if there's any other uh, questions that come up after this talk or you want to have more of a conversation, please feel free to reach out to me um, and uh, we can chat more. And on that note, I'll just add that Tamar Kodesh, one of our psychology interns and a current postdoc who's going on to us, a faculty position in Denver, um, has uh, recently published a study showing that the minority youth and families participating in the initial trial of safety acute actually got the greatest benefits. So the intervention really does work for different kinds of kids and families with adaptation, which it was. Thank you. Thank you.